from lesson number nine. I'm ready? Okay. All right, so we'll just put it, may not always remember, but we'll just put it over here to the side, part nine. All right. So, uh, let's go back. We'll review just a little bit. Then we got to finish up the, uh, the first church, the church at Ephesus, and then the second one will go into the church at Smyrna there. So we gave you the outline that you follow for each one of them, the revelator, the recipient, the review, the reproof, the remedy, the reward, and the reminder. So who is the revelator? Who is being revealed? Jesus is, okay? All right. Who is the recipient specifically? The angel of the church. Very good. All right. And what's the phrase that you see to every church that lets you know he's giving you the review? I know thy works. I know thy works. All right. And then the reproof, it kind of varies a little bit there. The remedy, the phrase is... Let him hear. Quotes on that. The reward to him that what? To him that overcometh. overcometh. All right. This will go better if y'all read it every once in a while. Him that overcometh. The reminder. He... That hath an ear. All right. So those are some of the key phrases, the outline, and we've got the churches right here. All right. So with that, let's back up. Uh, we'll do a quick review of... The first church, Ephesus, under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars. What do the stars represent? <coughs> Say angels. Good. All right. In his right hand, who walketh, walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. What do the candlesticks represent? Churches. Churches. Very good. I know thy works. Before we get to that, remember what you see when it talks about the revelator. It's referencing back to chapter 1 and that description of him there. Verse 2, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience for my name's sake, hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, the reproof, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. But this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans which I also hate. He that hath an ear let him hear what the Spirit saith unto churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So Remember, to each one of these churches, and this is where it's similar to like when Paul writes to the churches, these messages are to all of those that are going through the tribulation period. He's just given specific things to specific groups there. These churches, these are prophetic churches. They will be literal churches. So we, um, they have, some of them have not yet been established uh, the church at Thyatira, I think, is the one that they don't have any reference of a church ever being there back during that time. So remember, this is written, them believing that they are going to go through it in their lifetime there. So as we read this, we are looking at this not to make it practical to ourselves, but first off, we're looking at the message going to these churches for these people that will go through the tribulation period. What is their gospel? If somebody's going to preach the gospel during this time, huh? 
You have to endure to the end. What's the good? Well, that's, that's part of it, but if we were saying, what's the good news? What's the good news? Christ is coming back. You say, well, that's what we got. Right. It's just a different coming. It's not the rapture. It's the second coming. So the gospel for them is you endure to the end. Christ is coming back. You don't take the mark of the beast. You do what? You overcome. You work at it. You press. See, the Bible tells us, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what we do in our Christian lives after we get saved. These guys are doing it so that they can do what? When you look back up at verse uh, 7, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You guys, some of y'all maybe remember, we went through the book of Genesis. You had the two trees. You actually have more than that. But the two specifically, you had the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you had the tree of life. Remember, they got put out of the garden so that they could not partake of the tree of life while they were in a sin-cursed state. So when they overcome, they're going to receive the new covenant. When they receive the new covenant, they're going to be forgiven. God's going to do specific things for them, and they will be able to partake of the tree of life. When you partake of the tree of life, you are eternal, all right? So it's important for you as you're thinking through this that you think their way, not ours. Are they sealed unto the day of redemption? No, they're not. They're not sealed. They're not eternally secure. They have to overcome. They have to endure to the end there. And when you think that way as you read through it, it's going to make more sense there. All right? Sir. What's that? The tree of Right. Yeah, that's probably part. It probably went up sometime. I mean, there's there's that study you can do about when the uh, the question was. Somebody remembered to tell me this. The question was, when did the tree of life go um, go up to heaven, and when does it come back down there? We know there's. Evidence that talks about later on how the Ark of the Covenant went up. Preacher preached a message on that. And it will, um, so it was up in heaven there. But I've looked into it a little bit, but nothing that's specific enough to say, okay, when did it happen? When did it take place? Um, But, what's that? Probably, but it's probably one of those things where unless you find something specific that would give you a hint towards it, that's probably all you're going to have. I hadn't looked at it in a while. I can remember looking at it, but it seems like there was just maybe a thing or two that hinted, but there wasn't a whole lot, nothing where you could say, okay, I know it went up right here, went up here. It wasn't as definitive as uh, the study on when you when the Ark of the Covenant went up, So because it kind of... it. I kind of remember that too. If my memory was better, I'd be dangerous, all right? So, but that's, that's part of it. They get to partake of that. Now, here's what you need to remember. It, that's part of their gospel, their good news. You overcome, you get this. Do we need to partake of the tree of life? No, we don't have to. We were made a member of his body. We got something special that was hid in God. Remember this. Before the tree, before Adam and Eve, before all of those things, um, the age of grace was established as a mystery to be revealed there. So, uh, we're, let's see, I'm not going to go through too much of the review. We record these, so I want to make sure that we can move right along here. But what we did is we got to that section about the Nicolaitans. We got to verse 6 and we ran out of time. It says, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, in your Bible, words and places and groups 
um, can have specific meanings there. If you study the word the Nicolaitans, that first part, Nico, is to conquer, and Laetans, or laity, is people, to conquer the people there. Now, you got to remember this. You, know, you don't have anything really in history talking about the Nicolaitans. That's probably going to be a specific group that was going to be a problem during the tribulation period. Remember, there's things that haven't been revealed yet. You don't know who the Antichrist is going to be. You know there's going to be some form of Baal worship, but you don't know exactly how it's going to operate. There is going to be, as we go through this, we're going to see how the Antichrist is going to use religion and rebellion. You're going to see how that Jezebel and um, Balaam, as we study, we're going to look back at two Old Testament characters, and we're going to see how they represent two different things there that these people have to fight against and have to endure unto the end on there. So we'll get into more detail with that. So that's what the Nicolaitans, that's what it means, but we're not going to try to say, oh, well, they represent this, this, and this. Why? Because we know this is futuristic. We know that it is prophetical. So though that particular group, that could have something to do with a religious system that's going to go on during that time. But you think about this. How is the Antichrist going to conquer the people? He's going to send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. He is going to lie to them, and he is going to get them to believe in a religious system, but he's also going to get them to rebel and to give in to all manner of, of basically carnal-type things. Remember, those that endure to the end, we're going to see how they, you know, they're going to, they can't buy, they can't sell. They're not going to get all of the, th the, the pleasures and all the stuff the Antichrist is going to throw out there. Thus, you're going to have these two sides there, and they're going to have to fight this thing out. Think about it today. We're saved. We're either in the flesh or in the spirit. We have to deny this world system and everything it gives so that we can walk in the spirit. That's after we get saved. For these guys, they've got to do it so that they don't give in to the mark of the beast. So, well, I want you to see the contrast, but I also want you to see the comparisons as we go through there. So, with that, let's go ahead. I'm going to make sure we get through, because there's only four verses on this one, so we should be able to get through it here. The church at Smyrna, verses 8 through 11, let's read that. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. Ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death, of the second death there. So let's back up here and begin to uh, identify. We can look in verse 8, under the angel, that's the recipient, that'll be simple each time, of the church in Smyrna right. These things saith, representing the revelator Jesus, the first and the last. He's also called in chapter 1 in the Greek alphabet. What's the first and last letter called? The alpha and the omega. The first and the last. The beginning and the end. That which was dead and is alive. Now remember that statement. Remember one of the things the Antichrist the, all of his little minions there are going to have the ability to do signs and wonders and miracles. Those that are of the 144,000, Jehovah written right here, who can do signs, wonders, and miracles, they are going to be preaching that Christ came in the flesh in his first coming and that he died, was buried, and was resurrected and ascended bodily. You see, you say, oh, so they believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. They do. 
But the significance for them is they believe that he as king went back up to heaven and that he's going to come back in a bodily form and rule and reign with them on a literal, physical, visible kingdom there. So if we gave you the, <laughs> the little condensed version here and we've got Christ coming in his first coming there, you got the cross, we got him going back up, we've got the age of grace, We've got the rapture, Christ coming right there. We've got the seven, we've got the thousand. We've got that ending there. We've got Christ coming back at his second coming. So you've got those events that are there, just so you can see that. Just, what I want you to be able to do is just be able to put these things together and to see it there. That which was, a, that which was dead right here, he ascended, he, and he is alive, um, and that is talking about that resurrection and his return there. So that's what the 144,000 are going to be preaching, believing who he is, and in his power, he's coming back. Is he coming back just to take them to the clouds? No, he's coming back to clean house. He's coming back to take care of business. He will be wearing a... A robe, which means he will be the righteous judge. It will be a blood-stained robe, which means he's going to come back and conduct violence. As he spoke things into existence, he will speak things out of existence there. All right, very good. So, uh, verse 9, I know thy works and tribulation. All right, so that's kind of given, the tribulation part of it there. But he says, and poverty. Now, I hope you understand why are they going to be in poverty. Right. So... The reason for that, two, it's a twofold reason. And I want to show you something right quick. I want you to see this word poverty, and we want to go back. I want to show you something over here in Matthew chapter, um, oh, let's go, um, yeah, chapter 6, verse 25. This is the command that Christ gives. He's talking to the disciples. He's talking to those that are, baptized by John, who have identified with him and believe he's the Messiah. This is the crowd he's talking to. He is preparing them to go in and get through the tribulation period. He says, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on is not the life more than meat, food, and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap. What are we supposed to do today? Are we supposed to sow and reap today? Yes. Are they going to have, are there going to be any, a lot of farming going on? No, they ain't going farming. They ain't going hunting. They're not going to, they're not producing. All they're doing is going out and fulfilling what God has for them to do because they have a job to do in a specific amount of time there. You're not going to gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Here's something to remember. You're going to hear me say this over the next several months. There is a great comparison between the children of Israel coming out of Egypt and that journey from Egypt to the promised land that what they went through is a lot of similarities to what's going to go on during the tribulation period. They went through a lot of hardship. They had to be supernaturally fed. They had to be supernaturally cared for in their clothing there. God took care of them. So in essence, they're walking around. They have no refrigerator. They have no storage. They have no place to go and buy and sell. They are in poverty. They have nothing stored up. If somebody has things stored up and they have riches, they're not in poverty. If One of the definitions of somebody that is in poverty, they just don't have anything. 
They, there's nothing in the bank. They, they have no food. They only have limited clothing. Everything becomes very limited there. So you have to understand that definition. And he says, take no thought, saying, verse 31, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewith shall we be clothed? If we do that today, we do what? We die. All right? We starve to death. All right? So, for after all these things do Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Watch, and all these things shall be added unto you. Man, so many people sing that chorus. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And, you know, we can sing that and spiritualize it and say, okay, should we seek first the kingdom of God today? Yeah. And all these things, though. What are all these things? It's food, it's raiment, it's provision that God will supernaturally provide for. He doesn't do that today. Thus, we cannot claim that promise. Once again, take no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So they're going to go through all of these things. They will be in poverty. Now watch this. We go back to verse 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. This is the poverty they're talking about there. That they have to depend on God. Just like the children of Israel coming out depended on God for that manna every day. They are going to do the same thing. And he makes that little clause in there. But thou art rich. Are they going to be rewarded? Yes. They are going to be rich when this day comes and he sets up his government and his economics. And that, that, that hundredfold business is going to kick in there during the kingdom. And these people are going to be well, well taken care of during that time. So, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews and are not. During this time, there will be so much deceit and lying going on because people have the ability and power to do what? To do the signs, miracles, and wonders. Now, this is, let me, let, let, let's, let's make it a little touchy right here. During the tribulation period, people are going, there will be people who will have power and will have the wrong message. And they will be supporting the Antichrist. You know why there's a lot of confusion today, especially amongst people who believe in the signs, miracles, and wonders for today? Now, there's one side of it where a lot of them are probably saved. They mean well. They just don't understand the Bible rightly divided. And maybe they're looking at the Bible and saying, okay, this is something. And, and I can understand that because I grew up in that. And I knew they were, there was just good, solid people. And I didn't know any different, didn't know any better because that's all I'd ever heard. However, once you get that group trying to do it during this time period, there's a lot of deceit that goes on. Through the years, there have been people, you know, you hear, you hear Pastor Payne say it all the time, because I'll believe this if they can go do this at a hospital. But it always has to be done on a church, in a church service. You know what? If you play ball, where do you want to play? Your home court. <laughs> There's an advantage to home, home. It's called home court advantage. All right? You know, when they did the miracles that went on, all these things, those were done not in services, not set up. So there's a lot of deceit that goes on today with it. But the deceitfulness that's going to go on during this time will be legit because they can do it. And what are they going to do? We're Jews. They're going to come in and they're going to tell people they're Jews. See, some of this, as you're looking at these messages, some of this is instructing them for after the three and a half year period. If I was to come below this and draw you another timeline right here and just put, we just call this the seven year one, there's a lot of stuff that's going to go on right there. That we'll call also 42, 42 months. All right? There's a lot of events that are going to take place right here, right there, and right on the other side. You have the tribulation, you have the great tribulation. You have what we call evangelism, we have evasion. And you'll understand that more as 
we go through there. But see, the poverty and the, the Jew, you know, people saying that they're Jews, especially when the mark of the beast comes in about this time, it leads up to right here, the Antichrist goes into the temple, proclaims himself to be God, and starts saying, okay, in order for you to buy and sell, he's going to be over religion and government in that area there. And it, nobody will be able to buy and sell outside of having that mark of, of the beast, that mark of loyalty there. So you'll have the poverty and you'll have those who are trying to say, oh, we're Jews. We're Jews. They're going to try to go and root out all these people that have not taken the mark of the beast. Why? We're going to see as we go. They have an end in store for them, and we'll look at it here in just a second. So, verse 9, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. You say, what is the synagogue of Satan? That is going to be that religious system that he establishes and sets up. That will be ultimate, that ultimate Baal worship. It's not just Catholicism. It's not being a Muslim. It's not any of these other things. It's going to be out and out Baal worship that comes together. And it is going to be the Antichrist that Satan indwells who is going to be running that there. And there will be that blasphemy. There will be all the deceit that's going to go on. So he's warning them about that. Verse 10, fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. That's a tough message right there. Because this is a tough verse he's getting ready to lay out to them. He says, hey, don't be afraid because you're going to suffer. Just don't be afraid of it. He didn't say, don't be afraid. Your sufferings may not come. <laughs> That's not what he says. He says, fear not. Fear none of these things which thou, what's the next word? Shout, shout, suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. Now, look at this next part. It says, ye shall have tribulation ten days. Commentaries will try to make this represent a time period or something else. But you know, as we look at it, if there's not a reason to, to not take it literally, we're going to take it literally. Because it could be, is obviously if you have people who are not going to take the mark of the beast, and they're caught, because you got all these deceivers out there trying to get them, faking to be Jews, and they're caught. They're placed into prison. They have 10, they could be that they're going to put them in there, I'll give you 10 days. It could be for 10 days they're going to be tortured. It says right there that they're going to, ye shall have tribulation 10 days. It ain't going to be like the prisons of today where you're drinking Coke and, you know, watching television and going to the canteen and bartering cigarettes and stuff like that. No, it's going to be more like old school days of the, probably the, the dark ages there, and there will be torturing. Why? Because they're going to try to make people deny Christ, deny their faith, and not overcome. And then at the end of those 10 days, what's going to happen? He says, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That's a hard verse right there. But that's, that verse is to be taken literally. You just need to look. That's what they have to go through. This is the message to the church. It's not just don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't hang out with those that do. All right? This is, okay, guess what? Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast. Some of y'all are going to prison that ye may be tried, that ye, may have, that ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. That means if you make it through the ten days, then they're going to kill you on the last day. And I will give thee a crown of life. That's the severity of what they're going to go through. See, these guys are promised a resurrection as well. Those that are martyred during the tribulation period, they're going to come back with Christ. They're going to get to go up and be under the altar. They're there. I believe their bodies, I mean, if their bodies are still here on the earth, those bodies are going to have a resurrection. And they are going to come back to life. 
and they're going to be here with Christ. But that crown of life and stuff, they have to really believe. Their faith will be instantly tested. Think about this. If you were placed into a torturous prison for 10 days, if you make it through the 10 days, what's going to happen at the end? Well, let me give you a, um, <laughs> let me give you a, uh, a verse on that. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and uh, verse 4. He says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were, what? Beheaded. For the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Most likely, what's going to happen at the end of Revelation, or what he's talking to this church about, you're going to be, you're going to be tried and go through tribulation, probably torture for ten days, and then they're going to take you out and publicly behead you. Or you could take the mark of the beast. Now, some of us would say, man, ain't no way I'm taking the mark of the beast. Everybody that goes through that is going to be tempted. Thus, these things have to be laid out. Messages like this has to be poured out there. And it's just important for us, even though we understand we're not going to go through it, we need to really get a hold of the severity of what they're going through during that time there. You know, when you see passages in Scripture, like, um, let's, let's go back to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, and um, starting in verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered and fed thee thirsty, gave thee drink? When we saw thee as a stranger and took thee in, naked or clothed thee? When saw we thee sick or in prison or came unto thee? The king shall answer and say, And verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say unto them on the left, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And he goes through. He says, You didn't do these things. Verse 45, then shall he answer unto them, saying, Verily I say unto thee, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life everlasting. You see, the question is this. So you have to look at that story. And somebody in that state over here in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, somebody going through that, they have to realize, well, guess what? If you don't overcome this, you have to face him at the end of the tribulation period, because right here, I mean, at the end of the kingdom, because that right here is where we're going to have the great white throne judgment. That's how, well, GWTG, great white throne judgment. That's where they're going to be judged and they're going to be cast into the lake of fire there. So the decisions are going to be so hard. They've got to really see both sides of it there. Right in front of them is torture, 10 days worth. Right after that is public humiliation and possibly a guillotine that they would have to go and watch others, and then the crowds will come, probably like they used to, and watch these beheadings to strike fear into everyone. To say, okay, you know what? This is what happens if you don't take the mark. This is what happens if you get caught. If you evade and you get caught, this is what is going to take place. What's their comfort? A crown of life. 
a crown of life and eternal life. They have to decide, do they live for temporal things or eternal things? Now stop for just a minute and look up here at me. And one of the reasons we study this is so that we can appreciate the grace of God. We can appreciate what we have. These guys are going to go through this stuff. And it's life, it's, it's them looking down the road and trusting God enough to endure all this terrible stuff. For us, we're, we're eternally secure. And thus, because we don't have the heat and the tribulation bearing down on us, we take we, the decisions we make each day to walk in the spirit or in the flesh, we don't look at it like this. But remember, we're going to stand before the same God. We're going to have to give an account. Yes, sir. No, that the you'll have the hundred and forty four thousand of what they're going to have. That's not the new covenant. Those that'll have the word written in their hearts and have to teach each other. That's for this time period. The hundred and forty four thousand will be those select that are for that time there, and we'll we'll give more description on those guys as we get there. But there's a difference in those two there. All right, let's go quickly here and make sure we get through this last one so we can stay on uh, track here. Verse 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not, um, he that overcometh, where am I at? Shall not be hurt of the second death there. He shall not be hurt of the second death. If we go over to Revelation chapter 20, Look at verse 6 here. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such, watch this, the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years there. And then also down into um, verse 14. It says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. This is talking about these events right here at the great white throne judgment there. There will be a second death. Those that are cast into hell will be brought out, will be judged for their sins. They'll be cast into the lake of fire way out there somewhere. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. The new earth will have no hell inside of it there. So there won't, there'll no longer be that first, second, and third heaven. There won't be the deep anymore. You'll have those things. So Revelation 21 and verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So once again, when we come back, to Revelation chapter 2, and I want to just point these out each time. As you look at verse 11, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Is there any possible way if we're saved today that we could partake of that second death? No, we can't. Only those that can deny Christ during this time and die and be brought back out of hell during that time. We can't go to hell, thus, because we're forgiven, we cannot be judged of our sins there. So, you know, there, remember, there is hell. Hell's in the center of the earth. I've kind of drawn this diagram for you before. That's ugly. But I believe it's right there in the center. The Bible talks about it being that experience of falling, it being bottomless as the earth rotates. As it rotated, if it was circular, there would be no bottom to it there. This area around it probably represented um, Abraham's bosom there because they were able to see in over in Luke um, 16. But in the new heaven and the new earth, the new earth won't have any of that inside of it there. All right? So, verse 11, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. So, next week, we will, and actually it won't be next week because we won't have Bible study next week. Pergamos, um, next week on Monday, we won't have Bible study because we have our Thanksgiving service on Tuesday. So we don't do Bible study on that Monday night, all right? So if anybody has any questions afterwards, please let me know. Let's go ahead and pray.